Hello, and welcome to the Adventures in Earning podcast, where we analyze, explore, and celebrate the creative journey. My name is Julie Fafam Balzer, and I am a working artist living outside of Boston. I've been hosting this podcast with my super special co host and my mom, Eileen Shu Balzer, since 2012. Hi, mom. Hello there. So we're switching things up a little bit today. Mom is in charge. I mean, I don't, I don't think, think I'm, I'm in charge. charge. I'm a girl. I never say, relinquish I'm a girl being in charge. Yeah, but you're in charge all the time anyway, so which seems really unfair, but that's a separate issue that we don't have to work out therapy on this podcast, do we? Okay, so today is episode 148, and the theme that mom came up with is Must the Artistic Life Be a Solitary One? So, mom, do you want to um, get us started on this topic? Well, I think uh, one of the things uh, that people think is working away in your studio all by yourself, don't you feel isolated? And also, uh, are there different kinds of ways, not just painting and all that, but other kinds of artistic practice that seem to require aloneness, such as playwriting, uh, you know, or other kinds of writing, poetry, novels, doesn't that require a lot of alone time and isolation? And I think there is currently in the zeitgeist a lot of, there are a lot of articles about the uh, problem of loneliness in adults. I think the pandemic also made people think about it a lot. So you're the artist, Mm -hmm. and I wonder if you could talk a little about how you experience the difference between solitude and loneliness and ways in which you address it. So I want to state first off that I probably am not the best person to talk about this only because I remember years ago when I used to travel all the time and you asked me one time, you said, you know, you know, do you feel lonely when you're out on the road? And it like had never occurred to me because I had never once felt lonely. And I think this is the reason that I always say that I'm an introvert. Like I like spending time by myself. I don't tend to get lonely. Uh, I mean, I enjoy seeing other people, but I don't like need it to live. So I might be a bad person to talk about this, but I will say that I think that, um, I think that art is better when you're not alone. And I, and I extrapolate that out to a lot of different art forms. And so for instance, you know, playwrights, which you brought up and I have a background in the theater. So I know this, like, Yes, maybe you write by yourself, but playwrights often have groups. They spend a lot of times like talking to other writers about what they're working on. They spend time, you know, having actors read their work out loud and sort of workshopping it. They often have a director or a dramaturg they work with to kind of work things out. So it it is, uh, it's not collaborative because at the end of the day, the playwright is the writer, but it is not, I think, a totally lonely path. I don't know about poets or novelists or anything like that, although like editors exist for a reason. Writing groups exist for a reason. And I do think one of the things I remember reading in the New York Times many years ago, so this is probably ultra true now, is that in the olden days, i.e. the good old days of the like abstract expressionists in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, artists... So uh, lived in uh, sort of groupings, shall we say. So like you'd live in a building and there'd be a dancer living next door and a jazz trombonist living above you and a painter living below you. And what happened was a lot of cross collaboration where, you know, the the jazz trumpetist, trumpeter uh, would be inspired by the dancer who would be inspired by the painter who would be inspired by, you know what I mean? And it sort of went around and around. And so there was more cross-pollination. And I think that as housing has gotten more expensive in city centers, and also as people have been taught by social media to like, Specialize, 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 niche down, niche down, niche down. Like a lot of that cross pollination in everything. A lot of that cross pollination has kind of disappeared. I do think that artist residencies strive to give you some of that cross pollination. And um, I had a misconception about residencies my whole life that was basically like you went off to a cabin in the woods to be by yourself and make art by yourself. 
Right, but your lunch I, comes in a little basket exactly. that gets left on your porch. You don't speak to anyone during the day. But when I've talked to a lot of artists who've been to residence, Sees, almost all of them say the same thing that people who've been to business school say, which is uh, it's the people you meet that are the point. And so they've uh, they've all said, like, it's the people you meet, the person in the studio next to you, the person you meet at lunch, at dinner. You know, a lot of those events are communal. They often have like shows or get togethers. People wander in and out of studios. And it is much more of a sort of camp is the wrong word but kind of communal aloneness. Can that be such a thing? Sure. Um, which I think is not dissimilar from people who work in studio building. So I have, a, I'm lucky enough to have a studio here at my home and it's great. And it's great for my lifestyle right now because I can pop in and out because I have a little child, you know, and there are lots of other reasons why going away for a long period of time would be more difficult for me. I do a lot of work after he goes to sleep, actually. And I can be in the house. I have the monitor. You know what I mean? And it's fine. Right. You don't have to get a babysitter. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Or like today, my son is homesick from preschool. And he has been for the last three days. And so it has meant that like uh, I can run upstairs to like I had a live stream this morning or I had to do something that I can run back downstairs and deal with him. My husband had to go out. So then I, you know what I mean? And it's like, I don't have to go to a workplace. So there are lots of great things about having this home studio. Uh, but I do sometimes envy those artists who work in like an artist studio building, because I think the benefit of that is I see when I visit them how, you know, the person next door comes by and they mention a show they thought you'd be good for. And a gallerist is walking down the hall and you know the artist they're rocking with and you end up in a conversation with them. And do you know what I mean? There's more sort of like opportunity conversation kind of things that happen than a lot of community. That said, you know, like there is it is it's not like everything just comes so easily you still have to work at it you still have to like go out of your way to say hi to people some buildings are friendlier than others you know on and on and on so i know that the reason for instance that i joined a crick group this year for myself is because i really wanted to meet and get to know more artists in my community and like the crit is useful but it's not kind of the number one reason that i'm there you know, the number one reason I'm there is to like hear about other people's shows to to get to know a collection of like eight to 10 other, you know, female artists. And I think a lot of times that's true, which is um, I think. I, OK, let me tell you the structure that I think works for me in my life, which may not work for everybody else, which is I need stretches of alone. With some togetherness you know? And I think that that's probably true for a lot of artists. Some artists probably like to work together all the time and just have people around. And I would say like, there are people I hear about who their husband is, this is going to be totally sexist and I apologize, but this is just the people I know. They are real people. But like the husband plays video games and the wife reads a book and they're in the same room. That would make me insane. I don't want to read a book while I'm listening to your video game or watching you do it. Like I want to be by myself to do it. But I know other people who are like, I would love that we're together, but doing separate activities. So this is why, again, it comes back to what I always say, which is everybody is different. And what you have to learn, what you have to know is who you are. And then you can find the process, the stimulation, the environment that works for you. I think that's why some people thrive in a cubicle or in a co-working space and I would punch everybody in the face and that's just because I am not a co-working space person I don't want to work the coffee shop that. yeah yeah I, yeah. I am that, that, just makes me that incidentally that the idea of one giant great room in your house which is the kitchen the living room the dining room is all one big space there's a rebellion against it. I wouldn't say, I mean, they're not, you know, marshalling flaming torches at the gate, but some people are voting against that because they actually don't want to be together with everybody in their family all the time. Yeah. And I think, again, this comes down to personality. This is why, like, society is not monolithic, you know? You 
might love being in the middle of everything and the noise and the everything like makes you feel great. It makes you feel excited. It makes you feel energized. You love being able to have a conversation with this person at the same time as that and listen to the TV and do this. I, I can't do it. I can't do it. Like I want, I want space to myself. And There's I think this yeah. discussion nowadays about whether going to the office <clears throat> is better for the company, for the worker than staying at home and working remotely. And a lot of times it depends on the type of work you're doing and the type of office that it is. But I mean, the fact yeah. that it's even a raging debate means that there are people for whom one is better than the other. Um, the other thing I was gonna say is, why don't you talk a little about, I know you've said, if you're a working artist, you don't spend a huge chunk of your time actually doing your art. You spend a huge chunk of your time doing other things mm -hmm. and talk about some of those other things. And they may be ways where you can maximize your exposure to other people if you want. Yeah. I mean, so let's just talk about the term working artist. So when I open the podcast and I say I'm a working artist living outside of Boston, what I mean by that is that I make my living uh, at being an artist. And it's as opposed to being someone who is like just an artist and they may make a living and they may not. Um, and the only reason the definition's there for me is because I have to do a lot of stuff I don't want to do <laughs> in order to be a working artist. If I, if I, if I didn't have to make money at this job, I wouldn't do any of the administrative stuff. I would do very little of the social media. I wouldn't have a newsletter. I wouldn't, you know, spend hours and hours on, on just, you know, teaching classes, like all that kind of stuff. While I do enjoy that stuff, I would love to be able to just make art. I'd love to be a vessel that is filled constantly instead of a pitcher that always has to pour out into other people. <clears throat> but I'm so grateful to have this job and to get to do all those things. So let's talk about some of the things that I do on a daily basis. Let's so, uh, you know, there's, tons of computer work. I sit in front of this computer right here or that laptop behind me um, for hours every day. So there's uh, on the like writing side, there's writing text to go into a newsletter or social media posts or a blog or anything like that. There's um, writing up titles and descriptions for YouTube videos. There's uh, doing all sorts of photo editing, which then includes, of course, like YouTube thumbnails, getting photos ready for um, social. There's also like getting photos ready to go up into artwork archive or uh, onto my website or anything like that. There's video making, video editing. There's um, keeping track of tutorials that I want to do, recording them editing them, uploading them, writing text to go with them. There's writing lessons that go with classes. There's writing class descriptions. There's gathering um, testimonials, keeping track of them. There's all, all sorts of, uh, you know, trying to database and keep track of everything from supplies to who you've contacted. There's uh, outreaching to apply to various contests, galleries, shows, all that kind of stuff. There's writing artist statements, writing uh, project statements, writing, you know, uh, <clears throat> general like statements about what you're doing. There's um, trying to take in new information, new stimulus, reading books, reading articles, trying to stay up on art news, trying to stay networking online. So commenting on other people's work, uh, rep responding to comments on my own work, uh, you know, and this is all just the computer work. And there's probably other stuff that I'm not thinking about, but that's kind of like the basic stuff that all has to get done. And I think, uh, there's also for on the, still on the computer, designing uh, packaging, designing cards, designing flyers. I mean, there's a whole mm -hmm. lot of that sort of thing. Yeah. And that's just the computer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The computer. So I will say, like, when I used to, in my old apartment, I had my computer in a separate room than my studio. And the thing that was really great about that is I was really conscious of how much time I spent making art versus how much time I spent on the computer. And like, 
right now it's sort of hard to tell because like this is my computer. This is my studio. And it's all the same room. And so I can feel like, oh, I put in a good hard, you know, day of eight hours in the studio. But really, I probably spent seven and a half hours on the computer. Wow. Which is a which is not a great balance for me, like emotionally, what I would like to be doing. So I think, you know, I think one of the things because I do teach is that I always want to still be in love with making art. I never want to feel like uh, it's too much of a burden or there's too much work or like I always want to bring a really positive aura. I don't know if aura is the right word, a really positive attitude, a really positive energy into the classes and rooms. So because of that, I need to keep my finger in art making every single day so that I still have that like excitement about it. Because what I have found, and maybe some other people have found this too, is even if you like art, if you stop doing it, I mean, I think people say this about exercise too, it's just really hard to get started again. And then you feel frustrated because you're not good at it anymore. You're not as good as you used to. So I think like, even if it's just half an hour a day, I try to get consistent about always doing something, something dirty and messy every day so that I keep my finger in it, so to speak. So let's talk about some of the ways that you can fight isolation if you're feeling like you need mm -hmm. other people. I mean, some parts are obvious, like going to museums and exhibits and galleries with other people or to see the other people who are there. But there are Although things that are- I think sometimes obvious. that's more lonely. Okay. I know this is going to sound crazy, but I can sometimes, maybe this is from living in New York City for so long, but I can sometimes feel more lonely in a room full of people than I can by myself. Because when I'm by myself, like I'm aware that I'm by myself, I'm aware of something. But if I walk into a room full of strangers, like my own social anxiety or whatever else takes over, and if I don't know anybody, then I can feel very much like, oh, everybody else is having conversations and everybody else is interacting and I'm standing here by myself. So I think like when I'm seeking to have contact with other human beings for an art related thing, I find um, more useful to me is going to a class okay. because in a class, there's kind of an automatic connection. It tends to be more conversational. I can often find people who are more willing to kind of like just chit chat and talk to me. So I find classes are really good for meeting and hanging and out. I have with a built in subject. It's like going to a mm -hmm. wedding. You can always ask, how do you know the bridegroom, whatever? Yeah, and it's meet? like, oh. it, there's less social anxiety about it when you're in a class because, like, you're right there, you're working on something, you can make an offhand a comment, it's easy going. Like, I just, I just find it a little bit easier for me, at least, to get a hold. The other thing that I find um, really good for, like, getting out there, and this is somewhat related, is finding groups that are specifically meeting for a purpose. So like urban sketchers, they meet every week in most major cities. And it's a group of people you get together, you draw, and then usually everybody shares their drawings and then has like a drink or a coffee or something afterwards as a group. And again, you get to know people who might be interested in that. I think critique groups are like that. I think art interest groups are like that. But those are, are uh, um, groups that are designed for people who want to make friends you know what I mean? Rather than, right. you know, when you go to like a gallery or a museum or something, like people are not necessarily going there to make friends. That's not like, that's not like goal number one. So sometimes it can be harder to sort of get into it. Whereas people are wanting to be social at some of these things. They also have lots of like sip and draws where like you bring your sketchbook and you go to either coffee or alcohol related place, depending on what kind it is. I know that we have some groups like around here, there's a group called Women Artists in Action. I think that's what it is. And like, they just have get togethers once a month where they like, somebody crowd teaches a skill and everybody, you know what I mean, sort of chats and whatever. So I think that like, you can look for and find these kinds of opportunities. Um, the other thing to sort of get unlonely, if you can, do something like that is I think online, that's the place that a lot of people do it. And while some of those connections are you know, just through um, like text or message boards and stuff like that, you can make real life friends that way 
you know, over time. And I think that's always fun too, when you get to see some of those people or talk to them, you know, on the phone or on Zoom or whatever else in sort of IRL in real life. But I think the issue, I mean, loneliness is a hard issue to solve for the reason that I think it is not, I don't actually think it's external, which sounds funny. No, no but it. it's like, it is an internal feeling and that you can be lonely in a room full of people, a room, a house full of people, because I think that loneliness is really about feeling, I don't want to define the word with the word, but feeling alone. It's about feeling like nobody understands you or gets you or is hearing you or is listening you or nobody sees you. Nobody, you know, really, really gets it. And I think that that's like when they talk about being lonely in a marriage, right? It's not that you're not married. It's that you don't, your partner doesn't get you. And so I think at the end of the day, the goal to get unlonely has to be some version of it can't just be any human beings. I don't want to just be around anybody. Like I want to be, I want to be around people who see me, who value me, who get me. And I think one of the reasons I'm not lonely in my life is because I'm lucky enough to live in a house with both a husband and a child who value and see me. And I have you, my lovely mother, five minutes away, who also values and sees me. And so it means that I think I rarely feel lonely. I just have to say tell, my son. Tell them what your son, four-year-old son said to you today. Oh, so my, my son... <laughs> Uh, said to me today that he knows the most famous artist of all. And I said, you do? Who's that? And he said, Julie Fay Fan Balzer. <laughs> and, that, and that made any uh, loneliness I might have been feeling go away. But I mean, even, it, I think about it sometimes too, when like women talk about being home with small children and feeling lonely. Right. It's not that they're not being touched. 24 seven. It's not that somebody doesn't need them 24 seven, but I don't think they're feeling like those little children get them, understand them, are giving anything back to them. It's well, a little may, bit. Yeah. They're feeling, I think they're feeling that they do all the giving and the child does all the taking. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit what I said earlier about like, about being a pitcher versus being a vessel that gets filled and children are vessels that you fill and fill and fill and fill and fill, you know, and it's like, you're just like this endless pitcher pouring into them. And I think that you have to find the ways that you get filled up too. And All right. I, you know, so let's talk about some ways in which you get filled up, which mm. may not work for other people, but they're illustrative of the kind of approach you take so I, I don't want to be a broken record, but I really do find classes on, not just on art topics, but I enjoy learning. And so that's something that always fills me up is when I feel like I learn something, I gain something, I take something away. So I love to take classes of all kinds. And the same thing can be true. Like I love going to a lecture. I love going to, you know, a, an art talk. I love going to anything where I feel like, I am being given information. That that to me is very filling. I also read a lot. And I find that is something that also like makes me feel interested and excited. When I think about what it means to be uh, filled up for me, a lot of times what that is, is it's being, um, being either given knowledge or being given some kind of entertainment. And I think that that's why our phones are so enormously addictive because I know like you're consuming four different newspapers at any time, plus probably a couple yeah. <laughs> other things, you know, like you're just constantly like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the, you know, the, uh, yeah. the Washington Post, the Boston Post, New York Magazine, right? This, that, and the other. Here's an article for you. Here's an article for you. Here's an article for you, you know? And it's like, you're just consuming that knowledge, which is also entertaining for you. I know like my husband, Steve, sometimes calls TikTok the time machine because he says he picks it up for like, five minutes and then he looks up and it's 45 minutes later and he's like what the what you know 
And that's the entertainment factor. Or maybe he is getting knowledge. Maybe he is like learning a trick or finding something out. So, I mean, this is why our phones eat our time. Because I don't think I'm unusual in saying like I either want knowledge or entertainment and better if they can come together at the same time. Um, but that's what fills me up. That's what makes me feel like excited and whole. And I think like those are also the best social interactions for me. I love seeing friends when I feel like I learn something in our discussion. Maybe they tell me something about their job or their hobby or where they've been. And I'm like, wow, this is so interesting. Or they tell hilarious stories or we laugh together about something. And that's the entertainment factor. So for me, it's it has to be like knowledge and entertainment. When I talk to people and they say nothing, and they or they tell me stuff I already know, and they're not amusing in any way. For me, like that's when I'm like, I need to leave this social interaction right away because I just I can't stand it. And I think that's the reason that there are just some like TV shows or other things that don't work for me because they neither fulfill the entertainment nor the knowledge buttons that I personally need. I don't know. How do you get the point? Well, well, the point is, I was just going to say though, what I think what one of the things you're saying is that it doesn't have to be about art and yet it helps you not feel lonely. It can be about any topic that interests yeah. you. Uh, so you don't have to have like a one note life where mm -hmm. everything must be about art. If I'm not reading about Picasso, it's not good reading. I think if you're an artist, you're theoretically speaking to someone too. You're speaking to the people who are going to see your art. I mean, with some exceptions, people generally show you what they've been doing. They like that, especially if you you are a positive uh, influence. But and with lots of other arts, they also want to show you. I want to write this novel, but then I want people to read it. Yeah, wow. I mean, I think it's the thing, again, like, you're not an art robot, you know? And it's like, I think that the same way that that there's like a baseline of skill, right? This is the old idea of like, I want my doctor to have a baseline of skill, to actually like be talented, be interested. Do I need them to be reading medical journals in their off time? No. And in fact, I think like they're probably a better doctor if there's a more holistic approach, if they love something else, maybe they love running and they know tons about it. And like, it does come back and inform some of their work and some of their thoughts about the body, or maybe they love painting. And like, that does come back and inform some of their ideas about mental health and how to help other people. Like things aren't, things don't exist in neat little boxes. So it's like, I talk to my clients about this all the time. Okay, so you love wine and you love art. How do we mix the wine and the art together so they make sense? Like, how does your wine drinking influence your art? How does your art drinking influence how you feel about, you know, learning about wines and picking out special wines and, you know, or the same with like, okay, you love yoga and you love art. How, do, how does that mesh together? They don't have to be completely separate things. And again, this gets to this idea of as we like more and more brand ourselves and like everyone's a brand and your business has to niche down, we lose so many of the exciting, exotic edges of people. And instead, we're so focused on this idea of people as one thing, one story. And, you know, many, many years ago, uh, I'm trying to remember who the author was. I don't want to attribute to the wrong person. Um, but, but anyway, there was a Nigerian author and she came to college in the U.S. And her roommates knew she was from Nigeria and they were like, wow, your English is so good. And uh, if you don't know, English is the official language of Nigeria. So yes, her English was so good because they speak English in Nigeria. Um, and then they would, they were taking her around like their, she went to school somewhere in the South in America and they had like a very fancy suite and they were like, this is the stove. And she was like, I don't think you understand Nigeria. Like there are cities that rival any American city, you know? And like, what are you talking about? And, and it, 
what she realized in the process, and she said this is one of the reasons she wanted to be a writer, is that people have like one story about people. This is what Africans are like. You know, or this is what Southerners are like, or this is what, you know, Americans are like, or whatever it is. And the truth is not that. People are not little boxes that are just like one thing or the other. And she is interested in exploring in her writing the many facets of somebody. And I think like, I remember, so um, when I used to work in the theater, one of my favorite playwrights is Bertolt Brecht. And one of the things he used to talk about is um, actors would be frustrated and say like, what's my motivation for doing this? Like I just did X, why am I doing Y? And he'd be like, because you're a hypocrite because people are hypocrites. Why do people in plays have to do everything in a logical series of events? Do people in real life don't do that? Like you're a hypocrite, you know? And I've always thought that that is something to hang on to. Like people are, do things that don't make sense. People are complicated. And so all of us are that too. And so I think like all of the self-knowledge and all of the self-talk, and I think one of the reasons that I like thinking about who I am is because I know that the more I'm in control of who I am, what works for me, and all that kind of stuff, the more that I can be happy, the more that I can be successful, the more that I can do things I need to do to make my life better. And at the end of the day, I think like that's, that is the power of self-knowledge is being able to achieve what you want. If I know, like, so my husband and I talk about this all the time, he, he is a reflector. You tell him something, there's like no response. You wonder whether anything has gone in. And then four days later, he's talking to you about the thing you talked to him about. And he's like spent four days thinking about it, you know, and now he has the answers, the solution, the whatever. And like, that's such a different way than I operate that it's been a real learning curve to figure that out. But now that I know that he's that way, I will say to him, like, this is a big subject I would like to have a conversation about. These are the parts of it. You come back to me when you're ready to talk about it. But this is what I want to talk about. That way, he doesn't feel blindsided because he doesn't do well with like right in the moment coming up with stuff. And then I don't feel annoyed like he's stonewalling me because he isn't. He just needs to reflect. And then he comes back when he's thought about it and he's ready to talk about it. And then we have the conversation. And like what that means by discovering that is that we have a more harmonious relationship and we're both happy and able to communicate. And I think like, again, if you want to figure out, like, if you're lonely, how to be unlonely, why does that matter? Why should you spend any time doing it? The answer is because at the end of the day, if you understand yourself, then you can do something to make yourself, you know, happier, be in a better way, be less lonely, you know, whatever it is. And you can it, try different things. And incorporate the ones that work for you and move on from the strategies that don't work for you. Right. And listen, some people are, are in untenable situations. They can't escape a family, you know, situation that's making things really difficult for them. They have a chemical imbalance that is impossible to self-correct that requires medication. They, do you know what I mean? There are a thousand exceptions to this. So I'm talking about generally speaking, you know, can you think about what are some things that you can do, you know, based on how you get filled up in order to fill yourself up and, and also just to cross pollinate. And if you can't cross pollinate with people, can you cross pollinate within yourself? Meaning, okay, so I finished a painting last week and I named it. I named it time has Oh, I just, hold on. I don't think it has a has in it. <laughs> I named it Time Changed Me. Time Changed Me, right? And I was thinking about how it's actually a painting that I had done several years ago and I took it back and I reworked it and I changed it. And that's where it got the name, right? But then I realized when I was looking at it, it was listening to a book on tape uh, about werewolves and vampires <laughs> while I was painting it. And I suddenly started to wonder, 
if time change me had to do with, you know, werewolves getting changed and vampires getting changed. And that name had actually come from having listened to that book as much as anything else while I was working on it. And I know it sounds crazy to think of that as cross pollination, but it is a kind of cross pollination because it's like I was ensconced in this like fantasy world while I was working on this art and s- somewhere they m- the wires crossed, you know, and it's not like I had to paint a picture of a werewolf or a vampire, but who knows? I mean, when I start to look at the canvas, I start to really now wonder like half of it's dark, half of it's light. It's very like divided, good, bad. I don't know if there's something going on in my subconscious, but I do believe that cross-pollination is a thing, a real thing. Little red eyes, (laughs) sharp teeth. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Not quite like that. No blood drips or anything like that, but I think that they're, they're, you know, there's something always going on. So when you're teaching your child as you are every minute when you're with them, Mm -hmm. just by setting your example, What are ways that you encourage not feeling alone? Because the first thing that mothers discover, mothers and fathers, when you have a little kid is that they always want to see you, be with you, hang on to you, sit on you. It's very hard to be alone. It is. You know, um, one of the things that my son has trouble with is I'll sometimes say to him, like, I, I need an alone moment. I need some alone time. And he usually ends up crying. And then he says, you hurt my feelings because you said that you needed to be alone. And then we usually have a little talk where I say, do you sometimes say to me that you need privacy or you need to be alone? And he says, yes. And I said, you're not mad at me when you say that, but you just need a moment to yourself to like rethink things. And sometimes I need a moment to myself also, you know, and it's, it's, I think it's hard because I don't want to reject him anyway or make him feel bad, but I also feel like it's important to set up healthy boundaries so that he understands that like I'm a person and not just there to serve him constantly. So then you can extrapolate from that, that as a person in the world with a busy Mm -hmm. life, there are people who are always asking you to do things, right? Mm. And yes, and no hand, is a complete sentence. Yeah, I mean, there are <clears throat> things that you'd like to do, but you have to guard your art time. Yeah. Uh, and yet you don't want to cut off people and make them feel that you're not looking to be social. So yeah. there's a kind of delicate balancing act that you have to do to preserve your art time, which is precious when you, especially when you have a little kid Mm -hmm. and yet at the same time indicate a wish to be congenial. Yeah. I often try like, okay. So in the, at the end of the day, all adults are just grown up toddlers. Right. And so oftentimes with my child, I, the substitute method works where I'll, he'll say like, can I have a cookie? And I'll say, no, you can't have a cookie, but you can have, and then give him another, you know, option or two. So he's still getting something, even if it's not the thing that he wanted. Right. And it usually works most of the time. Um, But the thing about adults is I think you can do the same time, you know, or the same thing, which is like, if somebody invites you to something, you say, oh, you know, I'd love to do that. I, I generally speaking, like six to nine around here is absolutely impossible family time. And I can't do it. Can we rain check? for either a daytime event or maybe we could talk on the phone later and catch up you know like you give them options so that you're not just saying a flat out no but you are saying no to that now on the other hand i have had people approach me to do stuff that i just flat out don't have time for and they're also not necessarily like personal friends in which case i you know just say i can't do it or no thank you but sometimes i still do the offer thing with them where i'll say i can't help you why don't you reach out to x so it's not like a total dead end that sounds useful well, so the next time you call yeah just say i can't help you why I don't can't you help you Google? why don't you get hire a babysitter exactly exactly very useful. Very useful. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, I, I think again, just to get back to our topic, as I think yep. we're sort of in the wrap up here, one thing to think about about being solitary and and sort of the artist life is I think that it has to be a mix. I'm not sure that you could make art constantly surrounded by people because I think then you're constantly surrounded by also other people's ideas, other people's voices, other people's music, other, you know what I mean? Everybody just needs like what they're doing. Yeah. Could seep into yours. Yeah. And so it's like, you need some amount of isolation, but then we are social creatures. We benefit from cross pollination. And so the question is, can you find, you know, conversation in living human beings in some other place, people on the internet, you know, in books, in uh, reference material, like where can you find a conversation, something where your views are challenged? The best changes in my art have come from an idea that challenged me. Some of it was spot on, like in a critique about my art, but some of it was also like reading something random and being like, huh, if I put that in the context of my artwork, then that really changes things for me. The other thing is I, I want to say that there are all kinds of ways to have some social uh, interaction, but it doesn't have to be that you set aside a huge chunk of time. I mean, believe it or not, they've shown it's very important to have little chit chat conversations with the teller at the bank, with a person mm -hmm. on the bus. Mm -hmm. I mean, that mm -hmm. throughout your day, you can make an effort if you think it's important to you mm -hmm. to be social. Yeah. So I remember you, reading about a study where people were significantly happy if they ha happier if they had a small like 40 second interaction with like the barista in the morning, a stranger on the subway, like whatever else. And it's just it's a reminder to you to like smile at people and to chat with them. My son is the talkiest talker wow. of talkie town and will corner any stranger over any topic. And so I actually feel like I have a ton of social interaction just because He's Mr. Talky McTalkerson, and just every stranger, Actually, every stranger. You and I have both lived in New York and in Boston, and one of the big differences you notice is when you're online in New York, meaning standing in a line, people talk to each other yeah, without any hesitation. And when you're in line in Boston, they don't. <laughs> right. I don't know Although why I think that is. Phone culture just, has changed that a little yeah. bit. I think people are more into their phones, but yeah, there's just a kind of like chit chatty quality. And, and, and I, I like that. I like talking to strangers. Okay. So as we wrap up a couple thoughts for you. So practical color for painters is ongoing. Uh, color is a foundational part of making art. Uh, so join me for a wonderful interactive workshop that breaks down all of the complicated ideas down to simple and practical lessons. In person this summer, I'm teaching Art Alchemy, exploring golden brand paints and mediums. That's June 23rd through 25th. I just had a fantastic in-person cl class here at the studio. There's a YouTube video that I made all about it. So you can check that out. Um, mom came up with the topic today, which was kind of fun and a different way of coming at it. So thank you, mom. You say thank you, but you forced me. You were, and you were really pissed off when I didn't have a topic. I did. I, I, did. I feel that I, this is like, this is a sort of <laughs> press gang today. Well, you know, I also, I think that the question is like, what's the point of me doing the podcast with you instead of by myself? One of the things is you have a totally different perspective on things. A lot of times you come at things from a different angle than I do. You have a different, you know, generationally, like we're different just in terms of how we see the world and how we're willing, you know, what we're willing to do and not. And so it is great to have two perspectives, but it's even better if all the topics come from me, then to a certain extent, everything is from my perspective. But I feel like if some of the topics come from you, then some of the topics are also from your perspective, which just brings well, more. You know what would be useful is if people think of topics that relate to adventures in arting, they could send them into you. It doesn't mean we'll automatically take them up, but we might mm -hmm. find one 
that resonates with us or put a couple together. And so why not ask what topics they think would be interesting to them and EM or email you? Yeah, that's a great point. So feel free to leave a comment. You can do it either on the YouTube video version of this, or you can leave it on the podcast page. Either way, we'd love to hear from you. If you want to connect, you can find me at juliebalzer.com. There is a contact form on my website um, or all over social media as at Balzer Designs. You can sign up for the free weekly newsletter. That's the best way to make sure you keep up on the latest news. And if you'd like to help the show, you can leave a review, mention us on social media, or tell a friend. All of those things help other people find the show. So thanks so much for listening and subscribing. We'll see you the next time on the Adventures in Arting podcast. Bye.